Good morning, and welcome to Vantage Point Church, and welcome to week three of the divine. And we are talking about miracles, or as John calls them, signs that Jesus did that prove that Jesus is who he said he was, the way, the truth, and the life. And so our journey ultimately with Jesus is going to go straight through to the cross on Good Friday. And uh, I just got to stop here for a second, and I can't urge you enough to come and be a part of one of our Good Friday services. If you've never been to one, I can't urge you enough, whether you're joining us online, if you're anywhere in the area, or if you are here, um, our Good Friday service, I can almost guarantee you that it will be one of the most impacting, one of the most powerful and meaningful services that you will experience at Vantage Point Church during the entire year. We have two services, five o'clock, seven o'clock. There'll probably be a pretty good crowd, so make sure you get here. Make sure you invite your friends and your family. You've got to come. It will definitely make you ready for Easter, which is two days later, where Jesus is going to pull off the greatest miracle that he will ever pull off. And in fact, it's the reason for the hope that we have and the reason for our faith in the first place. As Pastor Andy Stanley likes to say, if a guy predicts his own death and resurrection and then pulls it off, I just go with whatever that man says, you know? And so we're going to celebrate Easter, but today we find ourselves with another really incredible story of Jesus doing something amazing that proves once again who he is. And so today we are going to be looking at John chapter 9, where Jesus heals the man born blind. So I wonder if you guys would stand up with me in honor of the reading of the word of God today. And let's read this great story. This this is a really cool and awesome story. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Father God, I pray that we, like the man in this story today, that we would Go from being blind in some way to seeing. I pray that our hearts would be opened up by you and by the truth found in your word. I pray that we would come to love you more, to know your son, Jesus Christ, more, to worship you more. And I pray that we would be changed as a result of your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, before you have a seat, just say hi to somebody. Let them know you're glad they're here at Vantage Point with you today. All right, so obviously the main point of the story is the same main point of the last three stories we've talked about, which is Jesus is awesome. Jesus is amazing. Jesus is powerful. Jesus is God. Jesus does things that nobody else can do. That's pretty much the sermon. Thanks for coming. See you guys later. I mean, we could pretty much end there. But there's some other really interesting things that happen in this story too that I think really help kind of put meat on those bones, if you will. And so, man, I love when I read a story like this because I've read this story many times. But I love when I read a story like this and I'm reading it and I read something I've never read before. Don't you? Does does that happen to you ever? Where you're reading a Bible story or passage that you've read maybe a hundred times and you go, man, I don't remember reading that. Or, man, I didn't really see that in that way. And then all of a sudden, it just like kind of, there are things in the Bible that I say, there are things that make you go, hmm, you know? Just like, hmm, that's good. Or like, hmm, I, I don't really remember reading that. I didn't know that. And so today, Today, what I'd love to do with you today is just find some of those nuggets that are buried in this story. Maybe some things that you've read the story before, but maybe you didn't really see before. And maybe some things that we can learn that will make the story come alive in a new and fresh way. They're just things that make you go, hmm. In fact, um, instead of, you know, your typical, like, instead of, what do you usually shout out? Most of you don't, but what would you shout out if I said something really awesome that you agreed with? What might you shout out? Amen, right? In church. 
Or wow, yeah, I like that guy, man. Wow. Okay, today instead of, okay, today, let's just, let's just, let's just be real. I'm going to make a lot of incredibly smart, interesting points, right? It's going to happen all throughout the service. Okay, instead of shouting out amen every time you hear something you agree with, I think we should do this. When we come across something that's just good, that's just interesting, maybe something we haven't learned before, um, we'll all just say, hmm, right? Let's, this is going to take some practice. So let's practice this. So I might say something, just use your imagination and pretend I said something really smart, okay? And then I say, you know, it's just one of those things that makes you go, Mm. Wow. Wow. I have a little confession to make. I actually had a hmm track. It is. Play it again. Play it again. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's why you guys sounded so good. Because I wasn't sure if you'd be into it or not. Okay? But I think you guys seem like you'll be into it. So we can keep that on standby. But I don't know if I'm going to need that or not. Okay. I tricked you guys, didn't I? You guys thought you were that loud. That was amazing. All right, first thing that might make you go, hmm. Okay, first interesting thing in this story. Right off the bat, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a blind man. Most of the miracles, especially when Jesus is healing people, most of the healing miracles you'll find are almost all the same. Somebody comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, would you heal me? Somebody brings somebody to Jesus and wants him to heal them. Somebody asks Jesus to come with them to heal somebody at home or something like that. Very rarely, this is very unique in this story because Jesus, nobody comes to Jesus and asks him to heal them. The blind man apparently doesn't even know Jesus is there, doesn't see Jesus, obviously, doesn't know who Jesus is, never asks Jesus to heal him. It's Jesus who sees the blind man. It's Jesus who comes to the blind man. It's Jesus who makes the approach and touches the blind man and changes his life. And, and it's kind of unique in this miracle, but I love it because I really think this is more of a picture of the way God has dealt with us. This is really what has happened to us. We were, the Bible says, lost in our blindness, in our darkness, without hope. We were very much, as much as this guy is physically, we were spiritually blind, never having seen. We didn't even know what light looks like, the Bible says. We were enemies of his. We were sinners. And it was while we were sinners, lost in our darkness, that God came to us. He didn't wait for us. There was nothing good in us to say, God, I want you. He came straight to us. He came out and touched us. If you are a follower of his, if you have received sight from your blindness, if you've received his forgiveness, it's because he, like Jesus in this story, saw you and approached you and touched and healed you. And so I love that Jesus does this in this case. It's very unique. It's one of the only miracles where Jesus does that. It's just a thing that makes you go, hmm, you guys are good. Okay, second interesting thing that I find is right after that, the disciples are going to ask Jesus a question. They see Jesus, see the blind man, and the disciples ask this question. It's kind of a strange question. They say, hey, Jesus, who why is this man blind? Who sinned that this man is blind? Him or his parents? It's kind of a weird question, right? Um, that they would assume that the man was blind and was born blind because his parents had sinned or because he was sinned. And I don't even get how that works. How is he born blind because of sin that he committed when he hasn't been born yet? But, and what Jesus says is, hey, neither of those things are true. Neither of those things are true. This is happening right now so that my works, the works of God, might be displayed in his life. And so I don't know if you're like me, but immediately I, got, I go to this question. Okay, so God, are you saying that you like zapped that little kid in the womb and made him blind just so Jesus could perform a miracle all these years later? And I don't know, I don't pretend to know all the ways that God works. And I won't stand up here with all the answers. Because I know that there's people who, who wonder that very question. God, did you do this to my child? And I don't think 
What Jesus is saying is that in all cases, God is the one that has caused this blindness. Let's just be real. Sin, the disciples were right in this case. Sin is the reason for the blindness. Sin is the reason for the, the disease and for the sickness and for the, all the things that we have in this world because we live in a fallen, sinful world and sin has corrupted everything. One day the Bible says it will be no more, that God will wipe it away. He'll wipe away the sin and along with that, the curse of all that sin brings and that one day there will be no more blindness or sickness or death, right? And yet, I don't know that Jesus is saying that God is the one who caused it. In fact, many of the commentators say something like this. One of them said, this does not mean that God deliberately caused the child to be born blind in order that many years later his glory would be displayed in the removal of the blindness. To think so would be an aspersion on the character of God. In other words, he's saying, I don't think this means that God actually caused the blindness, okay, just so that he could perform a miracle later. But what it does mean is that God overruled the disaster of the child's blindness so that when the child grew to manhood, he might, by the recovering of his sight, see the glory of God in the face of Christ. And others, like the people who saw the miracle, like us, reading about it, might turn to the true light of the world. Here's what I know. Sin causes things to break down, causes children to be born with blindness and other types of things, not because of their parents' sin or because of their sin, but because of sin. And what I know is this, that God is the master at redemption, isn't he? That God is the master at taking something that seems so tragic like a child being born blind and taking it and changing it into something beautiful. He is the master at taking the brokenness that sin causes and redeeming it and changing it into victory, changing it into us overcoming, changing it into him being glorified. And that's what Jesus is saying. You know what? This didn't happen because of his parents' sin or because of his. This happened because God is going to, I'm going to do something right now that you are not going to believe. And people for centuries are going to be talking about this and reading about this. And God is going to be glorified. And my name is going to be made great. And so that's what Jesus says is happening here. It's just a thing that makes you go, "Mm." yeah. Then Jesus says something else that kind of comes out of left field. I think it it doesn't even almost go with the story, but it does. You'll see how it does. But Jesus says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Doesn't it kind of seem like it comes out of left field here? What is Jesus saying here? What Jesus is saying, if I put it in a nutshell, is this. Time is short. Time is short. Jesus is saying, while I am in the world, I'm the light of the world, while it's daytime, while I'm here shining in this world, I have things I must do. I must be about the work of my Father who sent me here. Night is coming. There's going to be a time when I'm no longer here, when I can no longer do these things. Uh, It's going to be about five months from the day that Jesus is saying this to the day that Jesus is crucified. And what Jesus is saying is, I know my time is short. I must get to my Father's work right now now. And, and I love this because Jesus is talking to the disciples, but don't you feel him talking to you and me? Man, I do. I know as I've gotten older, I have understood this principle more and more, that time gets shorter and shorter. Time moves faster. That all the things that I thought that I might be able to do and accomplish in my life, my time to accomplish those things has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller And if I'm not careful, I can go years and look back and wonder, what did I accomplish? We can all do that. I have a journal. And this journal, um, on the very first page of the journal, it's dated January 1st, 2010. And this journal uh, on it, you could read it today. 
It says, I'm not a good journaler. I've never journaled before, but I really want to do this because I really want to write down the things that God is doing in my life, that he's teaching me, the things that I'm learning, the things that I'm accomplishing for him, the things that are happening in my family, the prayer requests that I'm seeing answered. And I want to fill the pages of this journal with that so that years later I could look back at this journal and I could see how faithful God has been to me. Would it shock you if I told you that the number of pages in that journal that are filled out are one? One. One. And you think it's funny, but it's not. In some ways, it's the saddest thing. I keep that journal. I've never continued on with that journal. I keep that journal as a reminder to me because when I look at that journal, I'll tell you what I, what I feel. I open it up. I read that. I remember that guy. It seems like it was just yesterday. I remember what I was feeling. I remember what I wanted to do. And I look at those empty pages and there's nothing sadder. There's nothing sadder to me than a to-do list that I look at you know, months later, and I look at it, and nothing was done. There's nothing sadder than a goal list that I've written down, and then a year later, I look at it, and I haven't accomplished any of it. There is nothing more sad than wasting time and not doing the things that you know that you need to do. And I keep that journal to remind myself that time is precious, and time is short, And when I know that I should do something, when I know that I need to do something for my family or for my friends or for this church, the people in this church or for God, I need to just get to it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Why do we have these cards? Why do we like, you know, you guys are probably sick of these cards, these cards. Why do you keep talking about these cards? Why do we talk about these cards? You know why we talk about these cards? Because you have friends and family who need Jesus. And you don't know how much time they have left. Man, if you're like me, you think, okay, I take a bunch of cards and I'm going to, I know this person, I'm going to write it out to. And there's been times, there's been years when I've been really good. And there's been years when I've looked back in the back of my car after Easter and I've seen two or three of these laying around. People who should have been invited that I just didn't do at the time that I knew I needed to do it. And Jesus is telling me, and he's telling you, you don't know how much time you have left. You don't know how many Easter's you will have left to invite that person to this church. You don't know. This may be their last Easter. This may be your last Easter. You don't know. You know what you know is you have today. And you should invite someone to Easter, and you should use this card because night is coming. Why should you get baptized? Because there's many of you here who have called yourselves believers and you've never been baptized and you are thinking about it this Easter and you're like, yeah, Easter, I don't know, man, I'm going to be dressed a little nicer. I'm going to have family around. I think Easter would kind of be a scary time to get baptized. I'd rather just get baptized some other time. But here's the thing is you don't know. That may be your last chance to get baptized. You don't know. I'm not trying to be, you know, morbid. I'm just saying we don't know. The Lord could come now. He could call you home now. He could call your friend home now. You don't know. And Jesus is saying, while it is today, I must be about the work of my Father. And I think that's the message that he's sharing to us too today. Don't let this day go by. Don't let this time go by. Don't let this Easter go by without doing what God, you know God wants you to do, and that's invite your friend or your family who needs to hear about the great love that Jesus has for them and could hear that in this place. If you need, you know you need to get baptized, just go sign up and get baptized. You will, you will be so glad you did. You don't want to be staring at a one-page filled out journal for the rest of of your life. There's things that, that's good truth, right? I mean, Jesus just, Jesus just slipped that in for free for us, but that is good truth. That's, that's something that makes you say, hmm, I'm going to need the track on that one. That's something that makes, yeah, that's right. Okay, now Jesus is going to get down to business of healing this guy, and this is where the story gets pretty interesting. Um, 
because this isn't the only time that Jesus has healed a blind man. You may have, you know, sometimes it's confusing in all the gospels and all the different stories. Jesus heals during his time seven to eight blind people that we know of, depending on whether one story is one or two. Um, but Jesus has healed people in a variety of ways of their blindness. He's just spoken and the person's eyes were opened. He has touched the person's eyes and their eyes were opened. He has walked up and spit on the person's eyes, which seems gross, but hey, the person could see afterwards. So I'm sure they probably didn't mind. And uh, there was one weird one where he heals the guy and then he says, can you see? And the guy says, I see people, but they look like trees. It's in the Bible. And then Jesus touches him again, and then he can see clearly. Weird one. But in this one, Jesus is going to do something he's never done before that is unique, and we're going to find out why he does it. What Jesus does is he bends down on the ground, and he spits. <laughs> Jesus must have more spit than I do, because I can't picture myself making that much mud. But, and he makes mud. What does it say? It says he he. He, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with his saliva. He put it on the man's eyes. He tells him to go wash in the pool. And the man goes and washes in the pool. Amazing miracle, once again, proving that the man who turned the water into wine, the man who fed thousands of people with just a couple little loaves and fish, the man who walked on the water is a man who literally just gave sight to a man who had never seen before. And he is God. And then part two of this story is where it gets kind of fun, where the controversy starts. Because the neighbors see the man. In verse 8, it says, His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, it only looks like him. But he himself insisted, No, I'm the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. And he replied, uh, the man they called Jesus. Now I want you to see this. I want you to watch this guy's journey from being a guy who has no idea who Jesus is. Jesus just passes by him. To a guy who's like, well, that guy they called Jesus. To eventually where he ends up in his faith. It's fascinating to see his transition and his journey there. But he says, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. And now you are going to see the Pharisees come after Jesus big time. They are going to try to cut this story off at the knees. Why? Because the Pharisees know this book inside and out. And they know two things. One, in all of the Old Testament, there's never been a person who healed a person born blind. This is a very one-of-a-kind miracle that is happening here. It's never happened in the Bible before or since. Other thing they know is that the prophets foretold that this miracle of giving sight to the blind is so incredible. The prophet said that the sign of the Messiah, the one that God was sending to come, would be that he would give sight to the blind. And so the Pharisees know if this story is allowed to stand, and this guy says, that guy made me see that the people are going to turn to Jesus and go, then you are the Messiah, because that's what the prophets foretold. And the Pharisees know this, and they are going to do everything they can to make sure that this story never gets out, and that they cut this story down as quickly as they, as they can. And so they asked the neighbors, bring this guy to us. And it was scary to go in front of the Pharisees. So verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. And why does John put that in here? Because this is a very crucial thing. John says it was the Sabbath. Why does he say that? Because as you know, the Jewish law said, um, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And on the, on the six days you work, and then on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, you don't work. You rest from your work. Now the Pharisees had made all these little laws around the laws that God had given. So God said, keep the Sabbath holy and don't work. Then the Pharisees made all these little laws around that to make it even more difficult to keep and to follow. So the Pharisees said, well, what is work? Well, carrying a burden is work. So what is a burden? So let's define a burden. The Pharisees defined a burden all the way down to if you carried more food than the weight of a dried fig. 
So you could carry a dried fig and it was okay. But if you carried anything heavier than that, it was work. It was a burden and you just broke the law. You couldn't carry more milk than you could swallow in one swallow. You couldn't carry more ink than you could write one letter with. If you could write two letters of the alphabet with it, it was work. You couldn't even help your neighbor if he was having problems or if if he was hurt. You couldn't help him because to help pick him up was work. You could not, according to the Pharisees, pick up your own child on the Sabbath because that was work. This is one of the reasons why Jesus had so many problems with the Pharisees. Because he said, you heap these things, these burdens on top of people and make it so difficult for them to follow God. Now, Jesus, knowing this, knowing the Pharisees are there, Jesus is going to get down and do something he's never done before, and he's going to make some mud. Why? You know that the word for mud is the exact same word for dough. And one of the laws the Pharisees had established is you could not knead dough on the Sabbath. And so Jesus knows this. And so Jesus gets down on his knee and begins kneading dough or mud or clay, knowing that it's going to be a violation of the Pharisees' interpretation of the Sabbath. And he's doing it on purpose. He's doing it to create a controversy. He's doing it because you remember when Jesus turned water into wine and he said, hey, my time hasn't yet come. And have you ever heard of when Jesus healed people and said, don't tell anybody yet because my time hasn't yet come? That's not this time. Jesus knows his time is short. He knows he's going to the cross and he's going full speed ahead. He knows that the things that he's doing right now are going to end up getting him killed. And he wants it to happen. And he wants clarity right now. He's going to start separating the people who believe in him and follow him from the people who do not believe in him and blaspheme him. And the Pharisees are definitely on this side. And Jesus is creating a firestorm right now by breaking the Sabbath in their eyes to create mud so that they will have clarity on which side they stand. And Jesus also wants them to know I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the one who determines what is good or not. And the Sabbath was made for rest and healing. And what better way to to heal somebody and to give rest to their burdens than to heal them of the burden of their blindness they've had for their entire life. Another reason I think Jesus uses the mud is this is just the way Jesus, this is the way God works. God almost always uses means. Do you, you see that in the Bible? Like God could just think or speak and it could happen. Jesus could have just healed him by thinking about it or by speaking about it. But so often God uses things. He uses us. He uses people. He uses means to accomplish his great and mighty work. It's like he uses soldiers and horses. What is Proverbs twenty-one thirty-one says? The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. Now, God doesn't need the horse. He doesn't need the soldier. He can be victorious without him, but God loves to include us in his great story and in his great work, and he uses the horse. He uses the rider to accomplish his great work. Whatever is in the Lord's hands is useful, and for you and I, we might think, God couldn't use me. And it's like Jesus is saying, hey, I used mud. I can use you too. Therefore, in verse 15, the Pharisees asked him, how had you received your sight? He says, I put, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, but how could a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. There were some Pharisees, like uh, you might think of Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, who were actually followers of Jesus by the end of his life. And some of them were really starting to think that this might be the Messiah. But most of the Pharisees didn't think so. They were divided. They turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replies, now look at where the man is now at this point. After the man has been able to digest what Jesus has done, the man says, well, he's a prophet. I mean, at least he's a prophet. He he made me see. 
Then the, the guy, the Pharisees go talk to the guy's parents. They don't get anywhere with the parents. So they come back to the guy. A second time they summon the man, verse 24, give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. And the guy says this great line. He says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind. Now I see. Isn't that great? Man, you ever, uh, you ever th- feel like you don't really have uh, enough to convince somebody to come to Christ, you know, to share your faith, and, and you wish that you knew more about the Bible, and you wish you knew more about theology, and hey, you should. You should know more about it, and keep reading, and keep learning, and stuff. But can I tell you this? The greatest apologetic for the Christian faith is you and your life. Why do I say that? Because you have a story to tell somebody and they may be able to stump you on all these questions about science and all these things and you may just have to say, I don't really know about that. Here's what I know. I was an addict and now I'm free. I was unfaithful and now I have this amazing marriage. I was a thief. And now I'm, uh, God has turned me into this generous person who gives. I don't know much, but I know this. I was blind, but now I see. You have a story to tell. It's the greatest apologetic for who Jesus is. You, 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 you shouldn't feel unworthy of telling that story because it's truly powerful. And that's what this man says. And who can argue with what he says Well, the Pharisees do, and they keep arguing with him to the point where the guy finally says, kind of sarcastically, I think, he's like, guys, this is great. You keep asking me over and over what he did to me. Do you guys want to be his disciples too? And that really ticks the Pharisees off, man. It says they were enraged. They curse him out, and they kick him out of the synagogue, which, you know, I don't know, if we kicked you out of church, would you care that much? You would. You people in here, I don't know. You online, I don't know if you would care as much. Just kidding. But for a person in the Jewish community, this was akin to almost death. Because you you couldn't have community. You couldn't have fellowship. This was your entire life was wrapped up in the synagogue. You couldn't worship God without going to the synagogue. So for this man to be kicked out of the synagogue by the Pharisees really meant he was ostracized out of the entire society. But I love this because Jesus hears that they've thrown him out. And again, Jesus goes to find him. And Jesus says, hey, come here. I heard you got kicked out of the synagogue. He's like, yeah. He says, don't worry about it. The the temple itself is going to be gone in a short time. Okay? Here's what's important. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Out of all of Jesus' miracles, I think the healing of the blind man best just kind of represents and pictures how God has saved and redeemed mankind at you and I. The Bible says that we were blind. We were without sight. We were lost in our sins. That God came to us That he offered forgiveness to us. He offered sight to us. John says that the light of the world came into a world full of darkness. The darkness could not understand it, could not overcome it. Whatever translation you read, the darkness was not powerful enough to overcome the light. But the Bible says that as many as received him to those he gave sight, healing from blindness to those he gave the right to be called children of God. And when Jesus was talking about the blind seeing, he wasn't just talking about physical blind seeing. He was talking about the spiritual blindness of this world and people who would be saved from their spiritual blindness. And now you and I have an opportunity to 
be healed by him. We have an opportunity to be used by him. Jesus uses spit and dirt and mud and us to spread, to continue his work, to spread the great news of forgiveness and his love and his light to a world. I mean, has the world ever needed anything more? We have the opportunity. May we be saved by him, healed by him, given sight by him, and then may we be used by him as instruments of his great grace to spread his light across this world, across our communities, to be living proof of a loving God, to help bring sight to the blind. May we all resonate with the author, with this man. I once was blind, but now I see. Would you worship God together right now and just thank him for his amazing grace, his amazing love for you and for me.